Somebody please turn up the heat. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, this is pretty exciting, isn't it? Um, Gwen Denhart's here, former chair of EcoTrust. A lot of EcoTrust staff uh, here and friends. Silas Beebe's here, my son. He's a designer, creative guy, designed these cool shoes. Uh, Sam Beebe, said, uh, Lydia Beebe. Uh, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Danny McGinley. Redside Development, he's there in the back. Way to go, Danny. He found this place for us and put the deal together to make it happen. Um, I think it's okay to share some news. Um, I was at the bank yesterday signing a huge stack of papers uh, while Bob Walsh, our partner, is in Hawaii. Um, and uh, we expect to close on the acquisition of the building, the whole block next door, the Mar Intrepid Marble Building, uh, adjacent to us here by about noon today. Uh, <clears throat> We've got some of the money, but not all of it. Um, it's uh, going to be a big, exciting, at least two years, I think, trying to figure this thing out. And once again, we've jumped into the deep end and don't really know what we're doing, but we're going to have at it. And uh, we love this kind of forum and the opportunity to meet with neighbors and friends uh, of all kinds and get uh, lots of ideas and, and uh, sort of make it up as we go. Um, Climate change, uh, design, creative thinking. Um, it's got to be the most important uh, sort of challenge to the human enterprise worldwide today. Um, there are probably a couple, well, lots of ways, different ways of thinking about uh, climate change, adaptation, mitigation. Um, avoidance, um, global weirding, as well as global warming. Here it is in Portland, the cherry trees are blooming, 16% of normal snowpack in the Cascades. New York Times this morning, coldest uh, winter since 1934. It's all getting a little crazy and it's only just getting started. And I think you could look at this whole problem sort of top down, big picture, uh, or bottom up. And the, the top down, big view, you can kind of imagine a, um, a global guy in conscience looking down, saying, what on Earth are you guys doing? It's getting really stuffy up here. And uh, by the way, the gods aren't crazy. I think you are. And that Coke bottle that rained down on the, that Bushman and San Bushman in South Africa, we didn't throw that Coke bottle down there. Um, probably was a passenger in one of those crazy uh, non-stop airline flights where everybody was smoking except you. Um, and they were flying by and they threw the Coke bottle out the window as they went by. And by the way, that stuff that was in that Coke bottle, don't drink it, it's really bad for you. <laughs> <clears throat> but the global picture, you can't help but think, okay, you look at big science, big data, big politics, a lot of ideology. Um, Big meetings, Q 
Kyoto, Copenhagen, Durban, Lima, United Nations, um, 350 parts per million. Now 400 parts per million. First time we've seen 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere for 8 million years. Um, climbing fast. At 450 it sort of goes wild and the feedback loops kick in and it's altogether unpredictable. Um, we've been at it for quite a while on the sort of big picture global approach and that's got to be done of course. Uh, we've got to scale up solutions to climate uh, and we have to do it quickly and we have to do it big but the problem's gotten worse since Kyoto, not better. And um, another way to think about it is to think, okay, here we are in Portland, Oregon. Um, and what's the nature of this place? And what can we do as citizens of this place to not just think about, but act on uh, the challenge? Uh, we're lucky, by the way, to have uh, uh, Sam Adams, our former mayor, uh, and Portland having actually done something locally about climate change and now Sam's in Washington DC with the uh, World Resources Institute um, on uh, climate policy. So local action turning into global policy I think is a good trend. Um, but if we think about climate uh, challenge and right here, I can't help but think about the nature of this place, the region, Pacific Northwest. Uh, the fact that we have some of the most uh, productive, diverse, rich forests in the world. That magnificent redwood, cedar, hemlock, spruce, fir, from San Francisco all the way up to Kodiak Island, Alaska. Trees that are dominated by winter wind and not by fire, by a lot of rain and the relative absence of summer drought. So the trees grow old and get big and get tall and store more carbon than any other ecosystem of any kind anywhere in the world. And we're busily replacing that magnificent uh, forest with a monoculture of tree farms, an industrial model of 35-year-old single species um, plantations that are storing a small fraction of the carbon that the forest that it replaced stored. So why aren't we thinking more about a model of forests and forestry, a kind of forest that grew the wood that this place was made out of uh, and imagine doubling or tripling the amount of carbon stored in those forests by growing the trees longer and growing cedar and spruce and hemlock as well as dug fir and incense cedar and Port Orford cedar and so forth. We could have a more diverse um, a forest, a healthier forest, produce, produces more wood and better water and better salmon runs. Uh, and reminds us that uh, the sort of big think, big global approach to climate kind of naturally leads to people, I think, looking for solutions uh, from the same mindset that created the problem in the first place, geoengineering and salting the atmosphere and putting iron in the, o in the ocean and uh, bioengineering things and... Uh, um, um, biofuels and carbon schemes and all the rest. Um, and I think if we look around here and think about what na how nature solves these problems, you'd be reminded that probably the best technology in the world, the oldest one, the most time tested, the most trial tested, the most abundant, the cheapest, the most efficient and effective method of getting carbon out of the atmosphere is photosynthesis. And that's what our forests do. In the presence of sunlight, moisture, chlorophyll, 
takes carbon dioxide and takes the carbon and stores it in carbohydrates that become wood like this and releases oxygen. It works. It's cheap. Been tested for not a few years. Didn't come out of a lab. Well, it did come out of a lab. Come out of a living lab. Um, and it's all around us and um, we sort of ignore it and um, go to the high tech, high finance, high engineer solution. Uh, photosynthesis is a good one and we ought to be reminded in a place like this how it can work for us instead of against us. Um, there's another process uh, when you think about the Northwest and the abundance of young volcanic soils, um, the grasslands, ranch lands in Eastern Oregon, the incredibly rich, productive Willamette Valley, Puget Trough, Sacramento Valley. Um, I don't pretend to be a scientist, but I'm slowly learning, I think, a little bit about how grasslands um, take CO2 out of the atmosphere. I'm talking about these things because I think the problem is not to reduce the emission, it's to reverse the emission in a sense. It's not just to do less bad because less bad is still bad. It's to do positive good. We've got to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and reverse that uh, trend of increasing parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. They go down, not up in numbers. But uh, grasslands um, co-evolved with grazing animals. Whether it's the African savanna or the American West, whether it's buffalo and antelope and elk and deer or gazelles and antelope and wildebeest and so forth in the African savanna, that coevolution is pretty interesting and, it's, and it happens usually with those big ungulates in the presence of predators that are constantly moving the ungulates. They're not standing in one place for very long or they get eaten. Um, so the, uh, the grass, I don't know if you've ever seen West Jackson, uh, the uh, Land Institute, Salinas, Kansas, been experimenting with perennial grasses and looking at the tall grass prairie and perennial crops. You've got these great photographs uh, of a, a, a tall grass prairie that might be three feet high or four feet high or five feet high. It was incredible. But the real uh, story is underground, and he rolls out this photograph of a tall grass prairie plant, a blue bunch wheatgrass or something, and the grass is about this high, but the roots would go down 10 or 12 feet. The roots, the underground infrastructure below that grass is incredible. So the grass grows up, the roots grow down, uh, then the buffalo come by and they crop it, and then all those little rootlets die, and that's carbon from CO2 in those rootlets that die off and go into the soil, and the buffalo keep moving, and the grass grows back up, and then the antelope come through, and the, gra and the, the, the roots go back out again to support all that, uh, that green um, grass above ground, and then it pumps more carbon into the, uh, into the ground, and that's the that's where the organic matter in the soil comes from and what feeds the micronutrients and the microorganisms underground that produce a healthy soil. That thin layer of productive matter between rock and the atmosphere that's so precious. Um, so I think if you, you, if you think about ranch land and farmland in Oregon and climate change and drawdown of, of CO2 out of the atmosphere and uh, our ability to grow healthy food and restore soils and preserve soils and preserve farmland um, and then connect that with the incredible energy that's in this room and creativity uh, in Portland around this uh, food movement. So how could we support, encourage the restoration of preservation of Farmland, ranch land, water, soils, forests. And uh, help support this remarkably inventive, industrious, 
um, community of people in this great city of ours. Um, so that's just sort of, I think, it's kind of early in the morning to try to be creative. Should be in a warm <laughs> coffee shop nearby drinking coffee, right? But uh, uh, that's sort of the way EcoTrust, I think, thinks about climate. Um, there's the big picture story, but there's the bottom up, kind of close, place-based. And in the end, everything's place-based. And what do we do to nourish both people and place? Uh, and uh, uh, when we got looking around with Danny and thought maybe we should do, I, some of you probably know the Natural Capital Center. I'm sort of curious, how many people know the EcoTrust building, the Patagonia store, Northwest? Most of you, not all of you. Um, we did that, but it's been 15 years and some of our board are saying, I don't get it. Why do you guys just do one-offs? Why do you just do one environmental bank? Why do you just do one old green building? Um, why don't you scale it up? Because um, we've got to get bigger and better and smarter and faster and uh, if we're going to even begin to address the, the real climate challenge. So well, that seems like a good idea. Um, so we got poking around with Redside uh, with Danny and thinking, well, maybe we should uh, do another building, green building. We're not sure what that would look like, but um, Central East Side, uh, everything between the freeway and Powell and the waterfront and maybe 12th uh, seems to be the hot spot in Portland right now. Uh, 1,200 businesses, 17,000 employees, the biggest job creator in the city, I think, and this idea of a, a maker movement and an artisanal economy and one that's not just dependent on the, the Intels and the Nikes and the kind of Amazon and Microsoft models, a few big ones, but encourage and support a larger number of smaller enterprises. It's more diversity. Uh, it's probably more resilient. And it's maybe even as much or more fun. So the Central East Side was really interesting to us. We poked around, we looked at probably 50 different blocks and buildings. And uh, then we looked more carefully at 10, and uh, Danny and Sam Beebe and I drove by here, and we couldn't get inside. It's this big, ugly parking lot in this green metal clad, nasty looking old building, but I don't know why, we just said, that's the one. Um, go get it, Danny. <laughs> and, uh, and then if he didn't do it, um, we were, came on the market, apparently about 50 different outfits from all around the country looked at it. Then they had about 13 or 14 bids and then boiled down to f about five real ones. And our understanding, I'm not sure if this is true, but our understanding is our offer was not the highest one, but the owners who've been in this neighborhood for a long time and uh, cared about the history of this place uh, thought, okay, good, if these people are gonna actually take care of this old building and fix it up, that'd be pretty great. So we did a deal with them in September, and I think it was a Tuesday, and uh, that afternoon, XOXO people paid us $30,000. They cleaned up the mess, they painted the whole outside, and 1,200 people were here on a Thursday and a Friday and a Saturday and a Sunday having a hell of a party. Um, it was a pretty great, a good way to get started. Well, and then Monday morning, somebody tipped over the outhouse uh, in the street, <laughs> and we had to clean up that back to reality, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so we pulled together, we've been shopping around and found our friends that we admire. Walsh Construction did the redevelopment of the Natural Capital Center. Those guys have built and rebuilt done more green wood frame construction than anybody else in the Northwest. They have the Northwest wood sort of sensibility. Uh, we found our friend Lindley Morton of uh, Green Gables, who's here, right there, uh, who understands Northwest uh, and uh, wood and wood frame and craft and craftsmanship. We found Opsis Architects, uh, who've done lots of wonderful, wonderful creative uh, space in the Northwest, uh, Walsh Construction, some good engineers and so forth, some friends, uh, banker friends, and so here we go. Uh, uh, 
One of the first things we did when we nailed this place down, we said, well, let's poke around the neighborhood because we're not, we're not really sure what we want to do, uh, but we'd rather have the neighborhood tell us what they'd like to see. And if the model of development that works is not to come in with a big idea and try to push it on a place, um, what if we tried to release the energy of the people that live in this place? That'd be kind of a different approach, a more natural model of development in a sense. Um, so let's go talk to the neighbors and find out who lives here and what they're thinking about. And our friend Eugenie Frerichs got on a bicycle and spent two weeks biking around about 125 blocks around this place and um, just talk to people. Who are you? What are you thinking about? What do you want to see in the neighborhood? And we got the very strong feedback. You know, we like it the way it is. We like this old industrial edge. We like the maker space. We like the artisanal economy. We like the gritty industrial, <clears throat> sometimes kind of dirty, cold <laughs> uh, space. Um, we don't want it to become like the Pearl. We don't want it all retail. We don't want chain stores. We don't con want condos all cranked out of one computer model. We want... <laughs> um, and uh, as we sort of surveyed, I wanted to read some of the... Uh, what she found in this neighborhood. Um, Eugenia... Uh, quoted our friend Jan Jane Jacobs uh, and uh, her idea of a model of development <clears throat> and said uh, the ecosystem, the kind of Central East Side ecosystem, in an ecosystem the essential contributions made within the conduit are created by diverse biological activities. In the teeming economy the essential contributions made within the conduit are created by diverse economic activities. That was Jane Jacobs. And what Eugenie found in this 120 block area, metal stamping, beer brewing, bike repair, woodworking instruction, low flush toilet sales, silk screening, mail service, cold coffee bottling, whiskey, vodka, and gin distilling, marble tile distribution, coffee, not for long. Um, uh, coffee roasting, coffee drinking, furniture building, with salvage wood, apparel design, talent casting, commercial photo shoots, movie making, pole dancing, instruction, fruit packing, night, late night drinking, late night clubbing, antique sales, furniture restoration, architectural preservation, bike commuting, public transit use, urban camping, graffiti, auto theft, banking, <laughs> dining out at all hours of the day and night, apartment living and goats grazing. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, but a theme, one of, the, one of the themes, of course, was food. And uh, Portland just got an amazing food thing going on. And we're surrounded by all this uh, beautiful farmland. And what if we could uh, imagine uh, building infrastructure to support a uh, connection, a real connection between the food movement and the kind of deep ecology of the Northwest? What if we could follow the Dan Barber idea of the third plate and have the consumer drive the restoration, preservation of the soil? The first plate, he wrote this book called The Third Plate. The first plate, American plate, was a, a big whack of meat and potatoes and a little bit of frozen peas. Uh, the second plate, this more recent one, is this idea of the uh, farm to table where these great sh new chefs are f figuring out all this beautiful things you can do with local fresh seasonal food. Um, and they are able to go around and sort of pick, cherry pick the very best of different things. But when Dan Barber started to look around and go to the farms and the ranches and find out what they needed to do to restore the soil, found they needed to uh, grow a diverse array of livestock of hogs and chickens and goats and pigs and, and uh, cattle, sheep, um, <clears throat> and in a rotational kind of uh, polyculture, and a diverse uh, bunch of crops, 
Uh, so there's legumes and alfalfa and grains and so in a sense what we need to do now, the third wave of this food movement is need to be um, take able to farm. We got to eat the stuff that the farmers need to grow to restore the soil. And that's going to mean eating a lot of stuff we never heard of before and kind of strange and new and different. Um, but what if this place could become uh, one place among the so many places in Portland that are inventing great stuff around food, but with the educate, the research, the education, uh, the deep connection between the ranchers and farmers and fishermen that are doing a good job trying to make a living growing good food, and all these crazy people in Portland that'll eat uh, uh, all kinds of good stuff, and all the chefs and cooks, and the kitchen crews and food accelerators and food innovation centers and um, James Beard markets and, and all the good things that are going on around food. So, so that's where we've sort of, what we've come to. We've, when we talk to the ranchers and farmers, they need a place in Portland in the urban center close in where they can aggregate supply, where they can have reliable storage and cold storage and freezer space and dry storage, uh, where they can do the last mile logistics, the last mile distribution. They don't want to be out on 82nd next to the airport near Milwaukee because they want their food delivered by Beeline. They want kids on bicycles and these 800 pound uh, power assisted trikes running around in the dark early hours uh, delivering 8,000 loaves of uh, Grand Central Bakery uh, bread from local grain to New Seasons and the restaurants and and the wholesalers and the food fronts and so forth. Um, so what do, we, what do we need to do to help Beeline grow, create more space? What do we need with some managed warehouse? Um, uh, they want space where, maker space, where they can do some of the last uh, part of value added meat processing, grain, malting, um, brewing. Um, culinary grains, baking, uh, vegetables, creamery, dairy, um, and could we uh, reshape this somehow to support kind of local uh, food making space in the key food sectors, meat, grain, vegetables, dairy, fish, um, <clears throat> so that those people that are inventing all that stuff could invent it right here so it really is maker production space but where there was also some retail connection. Um, could we imagine flexible workspace with the back office support and finance and branding and design and marketing to support those food entrepreneurs? Um, and uh, uh, so we've got, it, it became kind of like, wow, uh, we've got to do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and we fooled around with this block for a long time trying to figure out how we could do the warehousing piece, maybe build a sort of barn-like, grange-like, post and beam wood from local forest uh, uh, addition out here in this parking lot. But it got really expensive really fast. And we're getting all ready to do a $15 million restoration of this building. I had to solve most of the problem, and then that place next door came on the market in January, and we go, oh, now we're really in trouble. <clears throat> um, but that one, we looked at that space next door, and it's just a kind of an ugly warehouse and a storefront. Uh, but it got seismically upgraded in 2001. It's got great big metal cranes and lifts, and it's got backup doors for trucks. I never imagined spending so much time worrying about trucks, 58 foot trucks and how you back them up and unload them in the middle of the night and whether the city lets you park the trucks in the street or back them in or anyway, we were spending a lot of time worrying about all that. And here we found right next door, all that stuff's right there. So we went after it and um, found some, about $5 million and three weeks, and uh, we're gonna buy that thing today. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so.
So now we've got two blocks, and uh, if you look uh, behind you, it looks like a two-year, $22 million uh, effort. Uh, the warehouse is almost ready to go right now. We gave those guys three. They've got all this cool marble in there. If you get a chance, go through it, because it's, it's these sides of mountains from all over the world that got sliced into this amazing rock. And there's some of it that's, uh, you know, this place called the Red on Salmon Street. I should have said that at first, huh? <laughs> Red, that's R-E-D-D, -D. red. That's all of us Northwesterners know that's what a salmon does in the gravel, to, to uh, carve out a place in the gravel to lay the eggs in the cold, fresh water to nourish its, its uh, future generations. So the red on Salmon Street, um, <clears throat> uh, over there they've got these big slabs of marble and some of them are black gravel shiny, I mean, it's a big whack of fossilized gravel bed. It's really cool. I think we talked to him into giving us a couple of the pieces of that marble, the red um, uh, gravel. Uh, I don't know what we're gonna do with it. We're gonna put it somewhere though. It's gonna be pretty cool. Um, so, um, we are looking for tenants. And we've got people really interested in Northwest Food and Managed Warehouse and Beeline and restaurants and uh, bakeries and uh, charcuterie and cool stuff with grain and all these amazing people like Matt around here at Rogue uh, and uh, New Deal across the street. This is Distillery Row. Did you know this is Distillery Row? It's amazing what's going on here. So. Uh, we're going to clean this all up and uh, rebuild it much the way it was and trying to honor the history of this great building. You can see some of the photographs, 1915, uh, full block, two of these big barn-like post and beam old structures. The second one that was on the west half of this block was burned down. There was a guy who made kind of a career of burning down buildings. Uh, said he lit that one on fire and was sitting on the roof of this building when the police came by and ended his career. That was 1953. Uh, they never rebuilt it, but uh, thank goodness we've got the original drawings that Sam has dug out of the Oregon Historical Society and Peter Gray next door has uh, unearthed some of the old family photographs uh, that came from the history of this building and uh, it had an amazing industrial history. This is an ironworks and a forge. Um, and there were windows everywhere. It was all lit up like a big greenhouse, <clears throat> which is the least energy efficient kind of building you can possibly imagine. <laughs> and it was really expensive because for the amount of floor space, there's a lot of wall space and a lot of windows. But we're going to rebuild the cupola and have clear story and put in all the new, the, the, the old windows and open it up and do about 8,000 feet. This is 16,000 foot uh, floor plate. We'll do about 8,000 feet of mezzanine, lots of room up there. Um, they asked us if we wanted to keep this um, crazy machine behind us, um, and uh, we said absolutely. They said, well, good, because it cost $25,000 to move it. <laughs> <laughs> it goes 12 feet down into the cement. That big iron plate down there is some ladder. I, we didn't realize that. The old guy, when we first came and looked at it, uh, this place in May, this machine was cranking away. It's the biggest uh, hydraulic metal press in North America, I think. It's a little bit antiquated. We think it would make a really good juice squeezer. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to stay. We'll hopefully get a cleaned up a little bit. There'll be some big stairs, go up to some open uh, uh, mezzanine space, um, and, but big openings. And uh, we spent a lot of time worrying about whether to use big whole beam uh, timbers like this that we could get out of the woods from our own Ecotrust forest uh, forests or from F FSC stewardship, uh, forest stewardship uh, uh, certified uh, forest nearby. And then uh, Sam said, hey, wait a minute, what if we use those big old gantries uh, for the big beams uh, instead of uh, timber? And then there's some buildings that are getting restored downtown. Uh, SiteWorks is doing one at uh, Pine Street. And they've got some big timbers they were thinking about shipping to somebody back east. And so we're talking to them about bringing those over here. Anyway, so we'll recycle everything we can. Uh, we'll do everything we can with water, with light, uh, with solar. Uh, we're going to plant a lot of trees. And 
I like to think this could become kind of an oasis, sort of an eco-center, a watering hole for the food movement. <clears throat> Uh, where you're making good stuff and you're aggregating good food and you're sending it around the city and you're having meetings and parties and um, a lot of music and uh, uh, bonfires and uh, uh, we're going to have a good time here. So anyway, that's the Charter General idea. Thanks so much for uh, coming and listening to all this craziness. We need your help, uh, ideas, participation, support. Um, and. Uh, yeah, it'll be fun. Um, we were just thinking that today when we do a groundbreaking or maybe when we open it all up, we should ask everybody to bring one of their favorite old pieces of metal, you know, their old iPhones and grim, and we're gonna put it in this machine. <laughs> <coughs> and you're gonna take it home and it'll say the red on Salmon Street. So thank you very much. <laughs>